Greetings, peace and blessings. My name is Leah Penniman. I use all pronouns and I am the farm manager and one of the founding co-directors of Soul Fire Farm in Mohican Territory, Grafton, New York. I am also a member of clergy in two traditional indigenous West African religions, Yoruba and Bodun. I serve as an Omo Awo and as a Manye or queen mother. Soul Fire Farm is dedicated to uprooting racism and seeding sovereignty in the food system. We are a Black, Indigenous, and people of color-led community project that takes care of 80 acres of sacred mountainside territory. And we use our ancestral regenerative farming methods that increase biodiversity, capture carbon, and pull forth not just food and medicine, but also joy from the earth. All of this food that we grow and this medicine that we grow is boxed up and shared at no cost with the people who need it most in our local community through a doorstep delivery program called Solidarity Shares. In addition to growing this food and capturing carbon and increasing pollinators on the land, we serve as an educational institution that serves the black and brown aspiring and rising generation of farmers. We have young people come to the farm for programs, adults come for week-long immersions. Uh, we have a Soul Fire in the City urban community garden program that provides raised beds and soil and seeds and compost to folks who want to grow their own food. And recently the Braiding Seeds Fellowship, which provides a salary, mentorship, and professional development to a cohort of 10 new farmers every year. And our final sphere of work is advocacy and public education. We know that corporations are attempting to take over our entire food system and to build that food system on stolen lands, exploited labor, and the destruction of the sacred mother earth. So we band together regionally and nationally with the Heal Food Alliance, the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, and Via Campesina to push back and to try to make sure that the food system honors the earth and honors the people who love and care for the earth. There is a moral and spiritual perspective that informs our work. In Afro-Indigenous cosmology, we don't see the earth as our environment or even as a resource uh, to be conserved. We actually see the earth as a relative. And this became exceedingly clear to me when I was studying with the Queen Mothers in Ghana, West Africa in my early 20s. And they admonished us as Americans saying, you know, is it true that you would put a seed in the ground and you wouldn't pray or sing or dance or pour libation or even say thank you to the earth and then you would expect the seed to grow. And when I admitted that that was true, they said, that's why you're all sick, right? You're all sick because you treat the earth as a commodity and not as your mother. And so this perspective of the earth as a relative infuses everything we do. Of course, it informs the way that we farm at Soul Fire and the way that we hope others will adopt uh, across the globe, which is to use semi-permanent raised beds like the Obambo people, to use cover crops like Dr. George Washington Carver, uh, to build polyculture systems of perennials like you see across Nigeria, uh, to use compost in the way of, of the women of Liberia and Ghana who make African dark earth. Of course, it informs this but it also informs a perspective of ecological humility, where any time that we want to make a major change on the land, we ask permission first and we make offerings. For example, there was a swampy area on the land that we were hoping to turn into an irrigation pond. And rather than just hire some big excavators and have them come dig, we had a conversation with that swamp um, and with the spirits of the land about how they want uh, to be involved or not involved in this scheme, this human scheme. And they said no for nine years. Uh, we used a system of divination that comes out of Yoruba traditional religion. And when we got a no, we honored that no. It wasn't until 10 years of building a relationship with this land that the land felt comfortable with us making a change of that magnitude. And there were conditions and there were offerings to make. And this is very powerful because when we think of the way that Western civilization interacts with the environment, it is one of assumed supremacy that human beings can go and pillage and take whatever resources they want to on their own terms. And we really believe in, in the opposite, that human beings are the younger siblings of creation and that the rocks, 
you know, the mountains, the streams, the birds, they, these are our older siblings and they deserve respect and we need to learn to listen to them. The, there are many challenges that face young farmers today, especially farmers from Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and Asian communities. Um, and some of these challenges are number one, access to land. In the United States, 95% of the land by acres and 98% of the land by value is white owned. And this comes from a whole history of displacement and pillage. Indigenous people were forcibly removed from their land. Almost the entire continent was wrested away from their communities through attempted genocide. Black and brown people have been forbidden to own land for most of the history of this country. And even when black folks did manage to purchase 16 million acres by 1910, almost all of that was taken from them first uh, by outright racist violence and lynching by the Klan, the White Caps and the White Citizens Council, who saw a threat uh, in black land ownership and burned homes and communities to the ground and stealing deeds, but then also by the federal government. Uh, in the US, we have the Department of Agriculture that's responsible for providing loans and assistance to farmers and they would give this to white farmers, but not to black farmers, which led to foreclosures and land loss over time. So access to land is a huge issue uh, for indigenous black and other of people of color farmers. Another big challenge is access to capital and training. Uh, as mentioned, the federal government has made a habit of discriminating against farmers of color in terms of doling out resources and technical assistance. And because wealth in this country is so unfairly distributed and much of wealth can be traced back to slavery and exploitation, it means that, you know, when a, a white child in the U.S. takes their first breath, they're on average 16 times wealthier than a black child. And they weren't running a business in the womb, right? This is because of inheritance and this is because of uh, racial divides in terms of access to in that inherited wealth. So it's a big, big issue to have startup capital to farm, and that's something we need to address. And the third major issue in an area where Soul Fire Farm works very actively is training. In order to learn on a farm, uh, you know, many folks subject themselves to working for free as a volunteer, or they have to go far from home to a land grant university. And those, those pathways aren't as accessible to people of color. Um, working for free on a farm, it is only feasible if you have a nest egg in the bank uh, to still pay your phone bill and, and put gas in your car. Uh, going to a rural area where uh, that's very culturally conservative and might not be welcoming to you as a person of color uh, might not feel safe. And so we need to make sure that we have safe, culturally appropriate uh, path, career pathways and training available. And so that's one of the reasons that Soul Fire Farm has created its training programs and also its Braiding Seeds Fellowship to support farmers in accessing the knowledge that they need and learning from people who look like them and who have life experiences that resonate with their own. There is a common misconception that smallholder regenerative farming can't feed the world. And this is a dangerous misconception because even today, 70% of the food that we eat is grown by peasant farmers. Uh, whereas industrial agriculture is supplying just about a quarter of our food, but gobbling up 75% of the agricultural resources. Peasant farming has fed the world for thousands of years without trashing the planet. And there have been some very fascinating long longitudinal studies that compare regenerative agriculture to conventional or industrial agriculture. And while conventional or industrial agriculture with all of its big machines and pesticides and fertilizers can out yield organic in the short term, if you extend your study beyond one year, especially into a year where there's a drought, a flood or a pest outbreak, organic will match or exceed conventional agriculture because it's resilient, because it's biodiverse. Uh, because we plant many varieties. So if one uh, succumbs to a pest, there's something else that we can rely upon. Uh, because we add so much organic matter to the soil, it holds in moisture so we can withstand drought. And this is important because we are moving into a time where climate chaos can no longer be averted, uh, where we can expect wildfires, where we can expect extreme weather events, hurricanes and flooding. 
And we have to make sure that our agriculture can still feed us in the face of these unpredictable changes. So it's our hope that regenerative farming, particularly Afro-Indigenous and other Indigenous methods, um, are picked up and carried forward. Uh, we can all benefit from cover cropping, mulching, no-till systems, perennial polycultures. Uh, we can all benefit from using uh, conservation irrigation practices and uh, adding compost to our farms, providing pollinator habitat and using trap crops and other biological methods for pest control. And these can be as productive or more productive than conventional systems. They can feed the world. And they do something really magical in addition to feeding the world, which is leaving the ecosystem better than we found it. We've been taught that human beings are a plague or cancer on the earth, but in fact, we are part of the earth and part of nature. And when we follow the rules of ecosystems, we can make a contribution. And I say this from personal experience. When we first came to Soul Fire Farm and wedded ourselves to this land back in 2006, the soil was hard, gray, uh, lacking in organic matter, very low visible soil life. And we were told by the county agent for the Department of Agriculture that it would not be feasible to grow food, healthy food on this land. But it's what we could afford. And it's what so many marginalized people can afford is marginalized land. Um, and so we persisted and we used these technologies of our ancestors to bring the soil back to health. And after a decade of this work, you know, our soil tests bear out. Uh, our, our organic matter is at pre-colonial indigenous levels of over 10%. Uh, when we do a soil respiration test, we max out the measures of soil life and respiration within just a few hours out of a 24 hour period. Our, uh, when we did the aggregate stability or slake test, our soils match the forest in terms of their ability to hold their structure because of the bacterial glues um, that keep those aggregates stabilized. We can reach our hand down, you know, into the soil up to our elbow and it's friable and soft and malleable, whereas before you couldn't even stick a shovel into the ground. And so all of these are measures of soil life and soil health that we're very proud of. They're very proud of being able to collaborate with the earth uh, to capture tens of thousands of pounds of carbon per acre every single year. And these methods are scalable, these methods are accessible, um, and these methods are joyful. Since the food system is everything it takes to get sunshine onto your plate, there are so many points of intervention for folks who want to help. A few examples of things you can do include donating your land to indigenous people or encouraging the institutions that you're part of, like schools and places of worship to give the land back. Another important thing to do is get involved politically. See what the campaigns are that are being championed by black indigenous and people of color farmers, the people who tend the earth. In the US, folks are working really hard to pass the Fairness for Farm, Farm Workers Act and uh, the Justice for Black Farmers Act. And in every country, peasant farmers are organizing for their sovereignty, for their right to farm, uh, for the right for natural resources to continue to be available for them and their children. Getting involved politically is much more effective than limiting your activism simply to voting with your dollar. While we certainly encourage people to buy organic and regenerative food, to buy food from folks who treat their workers fairly, it's also important to raise your voice in the political sphere. I would encourage anyone who wants to learn more to visit our website, soulfirefarm.org, or follow us on social media at Soul Fire Farm, and also to read our book, Farming While Black, Soul Fire Farm's Practical Guide to Liberation on the Land. It has pretty much everything you need to know to grow your own food and medicine, and also a lot of information about the noble and beautiful history of Black agrarianism and how Soul Fire Farm got started. We have a new book coming out next year, Black Earth Wisdom, published by HarperCollins, and this will center the voices of Black people who have cultivated the art of listening to the earth and knowing what the earth is telling us to do next. I'll leave you with one of my 
favorite prayerful poems by Pablo Neruda. He wrote, Perdón si cuando quiero contar mi vida, es tierra lo que cuento. Esta es la tierra, crece en tu sangre y crece. Si apaga en tu sangre, tú te apagas. Pardon me if when I want to tell the story of my life, it is the land I talk about. This is the land. It grows in your blood and you grow. If it dies in your blood, you die out. Thank you.